thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, International Institute of Communication and ICD Qatar for inviting me um, to participate in this important discussion. And it's a privilege to be with my colleague panelist on, uh, uh, on this window. What I would like to do is to put some facts behind uh, the discussion of digital communication in the Middle East. Uh, I think from the distinguished speakers this morning, we've heard a lot about how digital communication and digital literacy is evolving and advancing, uh, pretty much from a global perspective and from an Australian angle too. Uh, and I think it's going to be relevant to bring back this discussion to our part of the world. Now, it's going to be difficult to have this discussion unless we put this into the context of what is um, enabling or uh, contributing to the development of our region, how our region is changing or has been changing over the past 10 years. And I would like to put to you that there are five um, sort of dynamics that are social economics, and, and they are important to sort of capture before we move into digital communication. Our region is mostly about tensions, and when I talk about tension, is positive tension. It's, it's always the tension between growth and balance. The first one has to do with our tradition, our culture, which seeks more of a stable environment, of a stable context, of a stable ecosystem. But the fact that in the 21st century, with digital communication, we're going to tolerate also some volatility. And, and the question this morning started to air on, on this side of the discussion. There is also a lot of, um, uh, and moving on to the second point, our region is, is very much prone to uh, hands-on management. I, I wouldn't say control, but there is a, there is a, there is a stronger affinity to see that things are uh, well-ordered, well-organized. And there is a realization also that in the 21st century, there has to be a bit of a laissez-faire, uh, and particularly with the youth generation uh, coming into the, uh, uh, to the mainstream economy. The third observation is that our economy is still primarily an economy that is driven by the public sector or the government. But at the same time, there's a growing window for the private sector to come in, and hence the sort of the, the contradiction in the term of public privatization. The fourth, the fourth dynamic has to do with fast and slow talent strategy. On the one hand, we have an extraordinary pool of talent uh, coming into the market, this whole uh, youth generation. And uh, at the same time, a realization that we don't yet have all the skills and the capabilities required to take on the challenges of the 21st century. So there's a, uh, there's a, there's a fast inflow, but at the same time, a slow uh, buildup of the capabilities. And how do you manage these two tension is going to be one of those challenges. And last but not least, open nationalism. Increasingly, as we open up this region to the part of the world, there's a sense of pride in our culture and our national values, and at the same time, uh, making sure that we remain open. So put into context, the digital discussion um, um, is important because otherwise we'll just talk about a technology per se and we forget about what is the fabric that matches this technology. Now, if you come to the technology and what is happening, there are four major trends, and Jeff has sort of tackled them this morning. One is an accelerated digitization in, in our part of the world. Two, the ubiquity of content access. Three is the demographic enablers, and I will talk about them, and it has to be more than youth. And last but not least, and to borrow from Don Tapscott's uh, latest book, is a growing up digital um, society in our part of the world, and this is not an exclusively Western concept. Let's put some number. We today in the MENA region have something close to um, 60 million connected users, and I'm being agnostic whether these are fixed or wireless there are today close to 60 million individuals who are connected to the web. Depending on which number you look at, probably there are 30 million connections, and then depending on how people have access and where, you can pretty much extrapolate, extrapolate and, and project this to 60 million. What is more interesting is that by 2014, this number will nearly double, and that's what's important to us. And nearly doubling means that we will reach a, an accessibility rate or a penetration rate of close to 30%. So that's a bit the magic number that Jeff referred to earlier this morning. So we're not far off from this mark. I will concede to you that this projection will err on the conservative side and, and probably reality will come back and surprise us in a positive manner. And what I put here is just the, the large countries for the message, for, to underscore the message that it is unlikely that any of the 
large countries that are economically challenged would be left behind. So naturally, we would expect Saudi Arabia um, to be there. But I will also put forward to you that countries like Egypt, who may not have the same um, economic enablers, will also be there in this digital uh, uh, generation. However, the landscape is going to change. If you take a dipstick as how people in our part of the world is going to access this digital world, what's going to be the screen, clearly the traditional media are going to lose the battle, whether it's starting from the, the left with the dailies, the magazines, uh, the traditional TVs, the radios, the VCR. This, is, this will continue to prevail, as Jeff has observed, but the, relevance is the, the growing relevance is going to go elsewhere, and it's on the right hand of the screen. It's in PCs, but mostly, mostly into mobile. The primary, primary device is going to be mobile, whether it's a mini iPhone or the, the mega iPhone, no matter what you call it, is going to be something that we can carry with us. Um, and, and to ex extrapolate, Japan has an interesting case. They have a social network uh, by the name of Mixi, and it has around 18 million users. 12 of the 18 million users access it via their mobile phones. They do not access it via IPC. I'll give you another immediate observation. Recently, the Telecom Regulatory Authority in the UAE made a statement to the effect that uh, they are likely to endorse more of a laissez-faire attitude when it comes to price control. So they said, we want to promote more competition along tariffs and prices. And what this has triggered is a very interesting discussion on Twitter uh, among end users. And, and I could observe from um, seniors I interact with both at Do and at Isalat how they were following this sort of Twitter uh, trail uh, to see what consumers were saying. So suddenly a policy was, was almost getting a, an immediate vote of, of yes or no. Most of them were yes, uh, uh, Muhammad. So just to reassure you, they were very happy with the statement. Um, and um, all of this was done via mobile phone. It was not via PC. So that's a reality that we'll be facing um, sooner rather than later. And that's a survey we conducted almost a year and a half ago, both in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And I, and I would submit to you that if we took this dipstick in Qatar, it's going to be very comparable. Now, the challenge is going to be where the screen is going. What is going to be the destination? Because it's one thing to talk about the highway. It's one thing to talk about the, the access means, so the car, the bus, the train, so that's the device. It's another thing to talk about the destination. At the moment, the dominant destinations are the TVs. So we're talking about the likes of Al Jazeera, and Al Arabiya. This is what's being accessed today in the online world. So I'm not talking about TV and audiovisual. I'm talking TV in the online version of them. In the blue area, you will see the more traditional dailies. So the likes of Al Riyadh, Al Ahram, Sharq Al Awsat, and what have you. What is interesting is you look into the gray area. These are the new dailies that came up only with the online version. And you could see that their readership is almost higher, if not higher, than the traditional version of the traditional dailies. So that's quite of an interesting observation. Um, just to uh, name a few, uh, Sabaq in Saudi Arabia, um, Akbar in Egypt, Yom in Egypt, and others. And again, this is not meant to be exhaustive. This is just to drive the point that the emergence of um, internet players or new media just in the online form is taking over the, the traditional ones. But we're not there yet. We're still very, very uh, subscale. Let me put some numbers, because at the end of the day, these media um, institutions have to make a living. They need to earn money. If you look at the UAE, which is probably the most advanced market from an advertising standpoint, whether it's online or traditional, you, look that, you can observe that the average number of campaigns per month for the top sites like Maktoum or AME Info could range between 50 and 60. That's a fraction of the equivalent uh, or a comparable medium in the Western world. Let me put some number behind it. In our part of the world, on average, um, the spending on online media in terms of um, advertising is probably close to $1 per capita. In the developed market, or in the US, it's closer to 40. So you could see the sort of the, the, the delta between these two paradigms and how much we still need to cover so that the, the, the online world becomes uh, economically viable. One way of doing that is certainly via uh, the advertising model. On the right-hand right, right hand side is a ranking of the top um, uh, the, the top audiences news websites in the Middle East. And we deliberately excluded the top three, natural top three, which in no particular order are Google, Facebook, and, and, um, and, and Yahoo, because these will sort of 
completely dwarf these. But if I take out these, uh, these giants, then you can start looking at Maktoum in, in position number 160 globally, and then Al Jazeera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're on the global map, but certainly not in the, in the top 100, and I think we can get better than this. Now, where is the growth going to come from, from a demographic standpoint? Certainly it's youth, and Jeff talked about it. And uh, my, my, uh, my uh, hypothesis to you is that the other major engine is going to be women, the women segment. Um, I was recently in a conference in Singapore where there was a lot of discussion around China and India and what these represents in terms of uh, economic engine for the 21st century. And my observation to the audience uh, there was that there was a third force that we're still not paying attention to, which was the third billion, which is the women segment, women who haven't had the opportunity yet to get the education they deserve and or to participate economically um, in a way that where they can realize their full potential. So you have this completely third billion that is not accounted for. Now, in the Middle East, it's not going to be a billion per se. The total population is closer to 300 million. But I can tell you it's going to be as important as the, the whole youth discussion. And, and we haven't paid attention adequately to it. And these are going to be the two engines. These are the engines that will drive online connectedness at a compounded annual growth rate of 13% year in, year out. Now, what they will be looking for, um, the youth and the female socialites will be looking for um, the, the typical content and in the online world that they would sort of would want to have in, in, in their real life. Sports, game, but importantly, social media. And again, Jeff has talked a lot about this this morning. We're still very, very short on, on social media. In fact, Facebook is a, um, it's quite strong in our part of the world, and there has to be something better that we can offer that is better customized to our audience. And we look at the current players and the current offerings. We're starting to get there, but we're certainly not fulfilling the demand. And, and to conclude on my observation, certainly this part of the world is growing up digital, but there, there are four things that we need to pay attention to. We have an increasingly young and affluent set of societies in, in the Middle East, and this is going to be an unprecedented seed for social and economic development. They are pro-choice, extremely knowledgeable, um, they're very good scrutinizers, they seek integration, so I would tend to disagree with the view that these communities are shrinking and shrinking and sort of isolating people. And last but not least, they get to do things much faster than our generation. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have is that people like me, people like many in the room, so people who were born pre-1985, are trying to figure out digital literacy policies for the next generation, the generation that was born post-1985. And it's, it's always very challenging because it is not in our DNA. We learn it, we use it, but we don't have it in our DNA like the generation that is post-1985. So as we sort of lay out these policies, it's always important to sort of judge them not from our own perspective and regulation, but from the perspective of the generation that will be the true recipient of them. And this generation, to move to my second point, is very tech savvy. Um, but in the Middle East, the experience, the destination is still very limited. And as long as it's limited, the cost, the opportunity cost is very high. Um, in many studies we've done with ICT Qatar, we have observed that for every 10% growth in, in ICT development, and certainly the whole digital literacy is one of them, there is a 1% enabler in, in, in general economic growth. And as long as we don't realize the full potential of the destination, um, then we're not going to fully realize the, the economic potential. Policies also will remain uh, remain at the moment mostly mixed and ambiguous in relation to the digital space in general and content in specific. And at the moment, it has to do more with enforcement and managed access. And probably this is a way to start. But again, this is going to be restrictive because we need to think about these policies with a view of the next generation, not our generation per se. Um, so maybe in the future, regulation could be geared more towards user education and incentives to do the right thing to borrow from the late Jean-Jacques Lafont, who introduced the concept of incentive-based regulation, maybe this is how we should think about it. On the one hand, we provide adequate education, adequate safeguard, and then what are the incentives as we as regulators are going to put in place so that the right thing happen in terms of uh, service provider behaviors and, and user behaviors. So taking this forward-looking approach and, and avoid being trapped in the mindset that has governed traditional media in the past. And again, this is not Middle East specific as an observation. This is the sort of evolution that all economies um, had to go through. So on this note, I would like to conclude my brief presentation. Thank you.